This is our third installment, and tonight our presenter is Judy Flores, Judy Selk Flores. She's going to talk to us about her continuing research on the Sanahi. So why did we ask Judy Flores to be a presenter in this series? In the 50th year of the celebration of Mark, Mark is and has been in operation for 50 years, we have brought back the seminar series. It's supposed to be a done on a regular basis, and it was supposed to be for the benefit of the Micronesian, Micronesian Studies program. Judy Flores is the first graduate of that program, and so it is our pleasure to have her here tonight. I asked her back in September before Robert Underwood did the first presentation, and she happened to be up in Saipan for the history uh, presentation there, and uh, she emailed back, of course, I'd be glad to, I'm honored. And actually the honor is ours, Judy, so we're very happy. We look forward to what she has to say about the Sanahi. The, the Sanahi has in its own presence become some, some sort of a controversial issue. What really is the Sanahi? Is it a male symbol? Is it for women? What does it represent? Is it for power? Is it associated with the moon? Is it associated with farming? Is it associated with canoeing? We'll find out from our presentation tonight. Many of us infer what we want on our artifacts, in our historical artifacts, because we don't have a really clear definition of what they represented at what time. My very first encounter with the witnessing of a Sanahi was up in Saipan. They found it in a, um, in a, at a cemetery. Uh, there was a dig, they were clearing for the building of a hotel, and there was only one that they found. It was not like the Sanahis that people use for ornamentation. It was a lot larger, very bulky, and no one really understood who wore it or whether it was worn for the, uh, by a Suruhanu or a Suruhana or was it a navigator, or as I said, was it a farmer? So today we infer what we want, and that's perfectly all right. We have uh, control of what we want and how we represent our history. So without any further ado, we want to welcome you uh, in behalf of our director, Monique Story at Mark, the president of the University of Guam, Robert Underwood, the sponsor of the, I mean the, um, College of um, Liberal Arts and Social Sciences Dean, James Selman, and of course the head of the Chamal Studies Program, James Vernis. And because of these individuals, we are here today. So please welcome, if you will, Judy Flores. Good evening, I'm glad to see you here. Uh, I noticed some of you wearing your sinahis. I ask you if you would please wear your sinahis so that at the end of this we can uh, all take a picture and I want to add it to my collection. Pictures, not the sinahis. Okay. <laughs> Going to start with a short film that some of you might recognize. It's been on YouTube for a while. It's by, it's by Triton, uh, UOG Triton Films. The crescent moon-shaped necklace, known as the Sanahi, has been found in ancient Chamorro burial sites. The symbolic meaning of the Sanahi to the ancient Chamorro people has long been lost, but the Chamorro youth of today still wear the Sanahi as a symbol of their heritage. This short film explores the past and present of the Sanahi and how it helps to connect the modern culture of the Chamorros with their ancient roots. The word Sinai uh, simply is a reference to the uh, moon face. In Chamorro we say Imatanipilan, the faces of the moon. And you're going back in time, you're trying to reconnect especially the current generation. Who are our ancestors? What were they like? What did they do? What did they create? Did the Chamorros create jewelry? Did they make jewelry and all that? Of course they did. 
and these are documented in some photograph uh, of the type of jewelry that were made and were buried in some of these uh, uh, pre-contact burial sites here, uh, at least on Guam. The Chamorros were no different than, than, than any other culture because like in, in, like in all cultures, the creation of art in this context of jewelry it's really a manifestation of their own uh, identity and their own uh, sense of adornment to their own bodies. And as I said, each culture has developed this and the Chamorros were, were no exception. We need, to, we need to know where we come from. Like the American Indians, they have a good history and, and it's documented where their roots are where they're coming from, where we've, we've practically lost that, that knowledge with our, with our culture. Uh, Sanahi is worn by um, somebody with significant um, uh, place in the, in, in the family or in the village. You know, the head of the family would be the one wearing the Sanahi, the head of the village would be wearing the Sanahi. Somebody with status. The chief would be the first and he would be, you know, because they have to prove themselves. Mm -hmm. So being that, he would be the strongest, the hardest, you know, and so they wear the Sanahi as a symbol of strength and leadership. So he's like the head of the clan, the head of the village. The shell was used, but then there's artifacts found that they made Sanahis out of, uh, out of salt, out of, you know, so there's, so that means that there's, they, they must have used different materials, you know. It could be a different village, they use a different material and they still work with the uh, Sanai. That's just my interpretation. You know? Back then, it would take almost a year to make one because, you know, the, the tools that was being used, um, there was no use of this, uh, a machine. So what, the, what they had to do was shave with rocks and rocks. Uh, shells and stones, you know. Let's say we're gonna do it with, we're gonna use it, uh, use bone. I could do one maybe half an hour. Where back then it would have to be little. If they were gonna make it out of bone back then, it would probably take a week. Art. Now, the Chamorro culture in, in pre contact days, and even the Chamorro culture that I caught, and I was born you know, 4,000 years after all of this, is the things that they did make, okay, were based basically on utilitarian uh, purposes. Now, when society begins to develop even further and further, then the art starts coming. Uh, these are icons that become very, very symbolic when the changes are becoming more uh, rapid, the changes are becoming more uh, uh, or impacting the younger generation, that they want a sense of identity, a sense of place to their own heritage. Through the Sanahi, the Chamorro youth of today is able to connect with their ancient ancestors. We may never know the true symbolic meaning of the Sanahi to the ancient Chamorros, but we can be sure that the youth of today will carry on the tradition of wearing the Sanahi and wearing it with pride. Thank you for watching this short film on connecting to the past through the Sanahi. We hope you enjoyed it. This was a uh, 2012 production uh, of a class, uh, Dr. Tenza's class here, and the, the students were shown, they were shown here in the film. Um, I like this film because it, it kind of encapsulates what people generally say about the Sinahi. Um, uh, it, it has the different points of view. It has, it has a lot of examples of beautiful Sinahi, for one thing. And then uh, uh, our historian, uh, Tony Ramirez, talked about the, the various uh, uh, 
historical aspects. So um, this kind of leads into what I'm going to talk about. Uh, my paper outlines the history of the Sinahi in contemporary times from its revival uh, from obscurity in the 1990s to its role in the development of Chamorro nationhood and identity. But this object is rarely noted in historical documents and the archaeologists have not reported finding it associated with burials. What was its function in ancient Chamorro society? Uh, it, in the film, it talked a little bit about uh, Chamorros losing their, the knowledge of their ancient culture. And uh, these, these, this list just outlines some of the things that caused us to forget about our ancient history. Uh, oral histories weren't passed on because of the genocide, the 300 years of Spanish and American uh, colonization. And then when we got into the post-World War II era, era especially, there was rapid Americanization and a severe drop in the use of the Chamorro language. For example, I learned Chamorro as a child growing up in Inarahan. Uh, and that was in uh, 1957. In, I started to see the parents were speaking English to their children. And it only takes one generation to see so much lost. So that was how rapid the drop was in the language and then the popular music uh, was replaced by, uh, you know, the radio songs from, from the States. And it, it was happening since the early 1900s, but it was so rapid after the war that a lot was lost. So in the 1970s, uh, this was countered by a, uh, 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 this was identity crisis, who are we, uh, was countered by a Chamorro cultural renaissance that began to take root in the 1970s. And the cultural renaissance was influenced by a lot of things, though some of it was global, uh, the brown movement, the indigenous movements all over the world. But locally, it was influenced a lot by, by our tourism industry, for example, which started in uh, 1962. And uh, there was a lot of construction. And as they were building the hotels and digging the excavations for the hotels, they started to discover our past. Uh, one of the earliest was excava excavations that were done for the stage, the band shell at Ipau. And I interviewed uh, Al Lizama in 1998. He was working for the Department of Parks and Recreation. And he shared with me these slides that they uh, took during the excavation. They found a very significant burial uh, of, they called her the Princess of Ipau because uh, she had so much body adornment on her. Most of her body adornment was spondylus. And uh, there was no evidence in this one of Sinahi. But it shows you the beginnings of starting to uh, reclaim our ancient heritage. And in the 1970s, a lot of things started to happen. The Chamorro history became an official class curriculum. And uh, that, was for the, that was the first time we had an official class curriculum in the history of Guam. Amazing. Thank you, Larry Cunningham and friends. Uh, the Chamorro arts and culture was showcased in the schools. And I was teaching at that time. And every, every school was trying to build the best huts. You probably, some of you might remember it. but. Uh, uh, and have the best parties, the best Chamorro food parties. So uh, there were political changes that were happening. Um, we started to realize, hey, Saipan is getting a better deal than us, you know? And uh, so the identity developed around nation building and Chamorro pride. I, I remember very clearly when I was teaching in the 1970s in the hallways of the junior high school, kids were saying, hey, Brown, Sometimes they even call me brown, you know. It was just a way of, of, of inverting that, that value that uh, white wasn't the supreme color, it was brown. So that, that was a, a real switch. 
And then an awareness of pre-colonial life awakened. They actually, people, I actually had people in interviews, I remember for uh, specifically Frank Rabone when I was interviewing him, our master, uh, Jamor Dance a master, he said, I suddenly realized that we existed before the Spanish. That's how much we had lost. So it, it was very profound. And Chamorros began to reconnect with their Pacific Island brothers and sisters. Chamorro artists started coming into the mix. Uh, artistic creation was inspired by other Pacific cultures. And especially when we started joining the uh, Festival of Pacific Arts. Uh, I remember the first Festival of Pacific Arts that Guam and uh, CNMI joined as a, uh, as a government function delegation was in 1988. And the, the, the arts that we sent to the 1988 Festival of Pacific Arts was those remembered by our elders. The, the weaving of coconut leaf, the bellum botudzan, the singing Kantan Chamarita, the blacksmith forge tools. Um, so we took, first took place uh, in that festival in Australia in 1988. And this is what uh, our presentations looked like in 1988. We had the Batsu, the Soltis, you know, the things that we remember from our elders, and that's normally how you, how you pass on a tradition. But here we had to go back in the Chamorro culture and reclaim and recreate an ancient tradition or many ancient traditions that had been lost. This was our first presentation of Chamorro dance at that festival in 1988. And this was uh, uh, Frank Rabone's first, first group of dancers. And it was the first time that people in the uh, other islanders could look at Guam and say, yeah, they're kind of like us, because we were so different. We were looking to California. We were looking at you know, the states, the mainland is what we called it, right? Um, notice here in this 1988 festival that there is very little body ornamentation. The artists weren't yet creating a lot of the body ornamentation that you see today. The first awareness of the Sinahi to the public, to me at least, and I think most of us, was when Angel Santos uh, formed the Nation Chamorro, and that was in 1991. He was an activist, and he wanted to have a symbol of what, what he stood for, and you can see in this picture and other pictures that he always wore a Sanahi. Now, I never asked Angel Santos, he never volunteered uh, that I know of, but people just assumed that he found it on a burial. And this is what I want to, to, to bring up to you uh, throughout this presentation, is that there were a lot of some assumptions made. Uh, what's a burial? Sometimes people confuse a human burial with just the buried artifacts. So those are the kind of assumptions that, that made this uh, enigma of the Sinahi um, develop. When I was doing my research for my PhD, uh, I uh, visited the Berlin Museum uh, for folk art, for uh, ethnic, ethnographic museum in Germany. And they were the only European museum that had Mariana artifacts on display. And there were three of them in a case. And these were six inches across, huge Sinahi. Uh, they, there was very little uh, with information with these artifacts. It just said, uh, from the Mariana Islands. Now, we assume that those uh, artifacts came from uh, the German governor, George Fritz, who uh, was the German governor uh, in the Northern Marianas in the early 1900s. And he described 
in his book, he described in 1904 these objects. He said the half moon shaped stones with pierced tips illustrated uh, were found in three places, in Tinian, in Saipan, and Alamagan. And they seemed to have served as money of the ancients. So he's not saying they were worn. He's making an assumption that they might have been used as money. And I'd just like to, to add here that he might have uh, made this assumption because in the Polynesian society, the whale's tooth is a form of very valuable money, if you call it that. And I would equate that to the Sinahi. Maybe it was used like the whale's tooth was used. And that might be what he was uh, referring to. And he said, uh, eight of the largest of these were found in the ruins of Alamagan, standing upright in a buried container made of fired bricks. I, I read somewhere else, and I can't find the, the source, but I also read that they were linked together and found in a clay jar. So there might be something in the, uh, in the translation that was different. But they were found in a container, hidden away, linked together. This is Fritz's sketch of the objects. And up here on the top right, he draws the objects and then he draws the cross sections. And he calls them ancient Chamorro pendants. So that's the first time we hear that it might have been because he used the word pendant, it might have been worn. He's assuming this. Nobody has ever seen them worn. And in the same time period, Hornbussel, Hans Hornbussel, uh, who did uh, uh, some amateur uh, archaeological work in Saipan and in Guam, uh, he donated his papers or turned in his papers uh, to the Bishop Museum. And, uh, this is available on, when I was researching, this particular sketch was available on microfilm. And it shows uh, two links were found, and they were linked together. He was doing a sketch of what it might look like according to Fritz's description of being linked together. So he's showing this. He didn't see it, he's just giving an example of what it might look like. Two links were found in Guam in excavating around Alati, and the larger one was found on the surface in Saipan. The sketch shows a possible method of attaching the links to each other. And uh, those of you who are familiar with the Sinai know that uh, the, it is drilled through the end and it diagonally comes out through the top. So that's a very uh, difficult way to drill and uh, artists take pride in be able, being able to reproduce that. The other thing he said was uh, the authority that these specimens are links of a necklace is that Mr. Malcolm was told by several natives of Saipan that former Governor Fritz had found a complete necklace of 12 links in a burial cave and that this necklace is now in a museum in Berlin. Now he's saying something that somebody told him that the natives interpreted, so keep that in mind. The Sinahi began to appear in private collections. Not a lot of them, but uh, Chamorros in the 1970s, and I interviewed several of them, they were proud of their ancient heritage, and they were seeing uh, scientific ex excavations taking place, uh, you know, where hotels were being built and so forth. And all these things were put in storage, and they would, didn't have any access to them. And I, I remember one comment a, a person made. She said, she said I, I, I saw this pile of sand. Her apartment was near a hotel construction site in the 70s. I saw this pile of sand and something glinted and I went over and I found this, this round uh, piece of uh, uh, spondylus. 
And she says, as an act of resistance, I took it. Because here, the, your, your, your heritage is being dug up and you have no access to it. It's being put in storage. Uh, several interviewees also described collecting things that were, where they would walk the paths in the jungle and uh, suddenly an object would appear. Not necessarily a sinahi, but something that was, was ancient would appear where they had walked many times before. And uh, this, this story, this kind of story is repeated again and again. So there's that concept that um, they appeared because the ancients want me to take care of this. So that was the, the way the collectors described their responsibility, to take care of what the ancient people, uh, ancient spirits had, had revealed to them. So by the 1990s, several collectors were showing and talking about their collections at schools, especially during Chamorro celebrations. And any Sanahi among these collections were greatly treasured by the collector, and their source was typically not shared. You don't want anybody else to know where you found your treasures, right? So it was not shared. The term Kalang, I just heard this recently when I was preparing for, for my talk in, in Saipan. It's attributed to an elder from Rhoda who told Mr. Richard Manglotnya the vernacular word for the, for the pendant, and they called it kalang. So that's where that came from, and you might hear that um, in talking about the Sinai. Uh, I, this picture was shared with me by uh, Noel, Noel uh, Kitigua from Saipan. He used to work for the HPO office. And he said, my first pendant was found in 1974 in Punta Agigan, Afetna, on the reef where the Santa Maria, Santa Maria, uh, Santa Margarita shipwrecked. Uh, it's now in the care of his nephew, who is a collector. The second one, he said, this was given to me by my sister, which she acquired from her friend, who found it on the burial remains in the island of Sariguan. The pendant was placed on the frontal neck section of the remains. Now this is the only reference I have that says it was actually found on a burial. And I'm sure Noel was aware and we are all aware that this is really third hand knowledge. I would love to hear this statement from the person who found it on the burial, but that's not possible. So I, uh, searched some more and I uh, asked John Castro, uh, John Mammy's Castro from uh, Saipan to, uh, to make a statement because he also worked as an HPO officer uh, uh, in Saipan. And he said, I have recovered this artifact on archeological sites, but I haven't encountered it on a burial. Saipan HPO has a beautiful piece still intact, six inches long, discovered during the testing phase of the courthouse construction, not on a burial. The other is the casino site in Saipan by Swift and Harper Archaeological Resources in 1995, and it was found uh, less than a foot below the surface, so that means it's not on, the burial, on a burial. In Luta, someone shared that he had found one after the road to Coconut Village was graded. Alimagan Island also encountered uh, one in a Lati site and exposed by erosion. So I, I asked my archaeology friends here, uh, Judith Amesbury, uh, if she had ever heard of any Sinahi being found um, on a burial. And she, she emailed back to me and she, her partner, Dar Darlene Moore. She says, Darlene Moore and I have done archeology span together on Guam, Saipan, Tinian and Rhoda for 29 years. And we have never worked on an excavation where a Sinai was discovered. Another archeologist, archeolo she's saying, I know, told me that uh, they found only one Sinai and it was not more than three or four inches. 
Again, she says, people sort of assume that these kind of items are found on human burials, but Darlene told me that she doesn't know of any Sinahi found on a human burial. That would make news among archaeologists. I know, uh, she uh, concludes by saying, I know that some collectors have old Sinahi that were found in the ground, but since collectors don't usually record the archaeological context, we don't know much about these artifacts. And then finally, I asked Scott Russell, uh, who uh, was a former HPO officer in, in Saipan, uh, to make a statement. And he said, the information about the linked necklace comes to Horn Vossel as secondhand information. It's hard to assess the accuracy of the statements given by Mr. Malcolm. In 1999, a German couple uh, in, in the Philippines arranged for our museum to receive a collection of index cards that described artifacts collected by Fritz, which he subsequently sent to the Berlin Museum of Ethnology. And I think uh, that was the only information that I, I saw with that uh, exhibit of Sinahi in Berlin, it was just, just a small typed uh, card. And, uh, and then he concludes, he says, the Sinahi that is in the latest collection of the book that he helped rewrite, the Chamorro that was written in uh, German by Fritz, um, there was no mention of a multiple Sinahi necklace with the other artifacts. And he says, I suspect that some of the details related to Malcolm might have been altered in translation. So again, we, we just come up with no verification that Sinahi were in burials, or if they were, they were very, very, very rare. And uh, were they a necklace? Were they worn? We still don't know. So let's go to the contemporary use of the Sinahi. And so while the use of the Sinahi in ancient times is inconclusive, the object has become a significant marker of uh, Chamorro identity today. And we saw through the film that uh, uh, how significant it has become. And again, we say it began with the formation of Nashon Chamorro, whose founder, Angel Santos, wore a Sinahi neck piece as a mark of Chamorro pride and a connection with his ancient heritage. So building nationalism was a, a strong uh, uh, impetus to, to Chamorro jewelry in general and the Sinahi became uh, synonymous with men's body ornamentation. Um, I'd just like to show this old picture uh, from 1994 at the Guam Micronesia Island Fair, and you see Pagat and uh, Johnny Seguenza and uh, Co. Frank St. Nicholas. And they're still around and they're still activists, and they don't quite look like this anymore. <laughs> So going back to Angel Santos, the Chamorro artists were sympathetic to the movement and they began to, to create tangible objects that harken back to a time before colonial interruptions. And by 1996, activists were using the Sinahi replicas. So uh, this is 1996. Uh, this one on the, on the left was Angel Santos being uh, confronting the uh, gatekeeper at the Marine uh, gate, and uh, he's wearing a Sinahi. And then uh, the Honolulu Star Bulletin in 1996 uh, took the, showed this picture of him with the Sinahi. And what's interesting is there are still other ways to express your Chamorro-ness. This man is wearing the uh, Spanish gold jewelry that was very, po very popular when I was growing up. It's still popular. Uh, but uh, not everyone was wearing Sinahi at that time. Joe Garrido, Joe Malari Garrido, in 1998, uh, they were, he was working on a project at the, um, uh, the Guam Gallery of Art in the Chamorro Village. The artists would gather there and they'd, they'd uh, you know, talk about what, what might have been. And Joe did these drawings uh, 
using contemporary faces that they thought might fit the uh, image of, a, of an ancient chief. So this is just artistic license, just saying this on the left is the way Chief Aguirin might have looked. And this one on the right is the way uh, Taga might have looked. And there's a book out that uh, kind of does that, uh, talks about various chiefs that, that they, uh, Magalahi, that they have uh, uh, discovered in a sentence here and there, and they've kind of just wanted to put faces on them. But what I found interesting was Joe put a Sinahi on each of these chiefs. Now, that's fine, you know, this is artistic license. But just keep in mind that these two chiefs were mentioned during the time of uh, San Vitoris in the early 1700s, late 1600s. And my research of uh, documents at that time by missionaries, by explorers, by uh, any, any of the documents I could find, do not mention ever seeing the Sinahi. They talk about the, the uh, spondylus, they talk about the turtle shell, but they do not talk about, uh, describe the Sinahi in any way. And uh, Joe Guerrero was one of the early people in uh, 2000 who started drawing the, or, or creating the Sinahi. And I have one here, and I think uh, Joe actually has the piece with him again made from the giant clam shell. And then another well-known person whose nickname became Sinahi uh, about this time in 2000 because he was very successful in being able to carve this object out of the brittle uh, giant clam shell and drill that final drill through to tie the cord and it didn't break because that's, that's the, the test of a good Sinahi uh, carver. So this, he, he still has his, uh, his shop. So the power of social media. And uh, in today's society, you really need to, of course you do the hard research, you go to Mark and you, 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 know, you, you do the, the reading, but you've got to do uh, a scanning of the social media because that's where everything is. And whether it's good or bad, it's there. So let's look at some of this. Uh, these are ones that I found that were really interesting. Um, the Guahan Heritage carvings, uh, that's George Francisco that you saw on the film. Uh, he has his, his own uh, YouTube uh, film. And then, of course, we have Guampedia that I always look to because it's a juried, uh, uh, you submit and it's juried and uh, so that you know it has some, uh, uh, it, it's, been, it's been vetted in other words. New Moon Creations, that's uh, uh, Ben Del, Del Rosario. And then uh, Mama Jill, who has her shop up there uh, on uh, Sagan Kutura behind the Hilton. And then the one that I just, just showed you, connecting the past to the Sinahi. And Island Images, if you go to the military channel, uh, they often interview artists and you will find information there. Now, it's the nature of artists to be inspired by ideas and to express their inspirations. Um, by their creative nature, they exceed boundaries set by historical, archaeological, geographical, and many other parameters. That's, that's what you do when you're an artist. It's acceptable. So the question each artist must answer for themselves is, what is my artistic goal? What is the story behind my art? Now, it's problematic to authenticate cultural property, and, and, and this is just in general. Uh, but to try to uh, authenticate, well, it didn't really happen that way, so you shouldn't be doing this. This is not what this talk is about. Uh, 
And uh, this was brought home uh, by a statement made by Dr. Vince Diaz in 1995 when we were uh, questioning another, uh, another aspect of ancient Chamorro culture. Did it really happen? And we asked him, being from Mark, whether he, he could speak on that. So this is what he answered. He said, the harm comes when the question of authenticity and the process of authenticating and you're drawing upon very specific time periods and, per, and per, perspectives and using that as grounds for certification. It ends up employing narrow definitions of culture and history. It hurts the self and hampers progress when the question of authenticity and the process, process of authenticating something becomes a process that suffocates a people's cultural ability to revive, invent, create, and innovate. He said, in my studies of Chamorro and Micronesian custom and tradition, the most inspiring theme of history is the culture's durabilities, their abilities to move their traditions and customs throughout the course of time and influence from without. So what can we say about Sinahi? Example, we don't know how our ancestors used the object we call Sinahi today. We do know that it was so valuable that no historical accounts ever reported seeing it. Today, we respect, we respect the high artistic skill of our ancestors who made the Sinahi by wearing it proudly as a symbol of our Chamorro heritage. And one way to avoid the authentication problem is to say, this is my interpretation. So in conclusion, this brief overview of artistic production since the 1970s shows that the makers of Chamorro heritage jewelry have progressed in their artistic skills to a level that can compare favor favorably with any place else. The art produced shows examples of beautiful interpretations and fine workmanship that has been inspired by ancient artifacts. They emote a sense of cultural pride and identity for those who admire and wear them. Sanahi is a term that means quarter moon or a moon in some of its phases, and it has also been called kalan. And although George Fritz found and gave Chamorro Sanahi to the Mer Berlin Museum and sketched them in his book, he does not explain where he found them. Hornbossel's notes and sketch say that he was told that they came from a burial cave, not on burial remains. A few Sanahi have been found in archaeological excavations, and according to the archaeologist, none have been found on a burial. A few collectors have them in their collections. None can be officially verified that they were found on a burial. However, that doesn't mean that it couldn't have happened at some time in our history. The heirs of our ancient culture can decide how important is the authentication of ancient use. In this search, we need to have open sharing of information among the collectors, historians, and archaeologists. Until then, the Sanahi remains an enigma from ancient Chamorro times. Let us continue the conversation. Thank you. So questions and answers? Anybody have a question for Judy? Anybody have questions? Anybody yes. Have? Uh, it seems that most of the uh, documentation uh, about the Sinai was found in the Northern area of science. Are there any historical documents talking about the uh, older finds here in Guam? Historical documents. Um, well, our awareness of the Sinai only, only started in about the 1990s. Uh, as I said, I've done a thorough research of, of uh, missionary documents, you know, visitors through, through the time of discovery, uh, time of contact. Um, there has been no mention of the Sinahi in these documents. Mike, are you aware of any burials that you've done here at Guam with any Sinahi? No? Anybody else over here? Question? Um, can you say something about the gender aspects of the Sanahi 
it's typically worn by men, but sometimes women will wear it. And are there anything in the historical records about gender related to Sanahi? No, just as there's nothing about Sinai, there's, there's nothing about gender, but this is something that uh, I, I think, you know, the, 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 from the time of Fritz and these others, again, they assumed that it was worn, and we have to ask the question, was it worn? Uh, or was it a treasure that was put in, in hiding until they needed it to, to do a, a big exchange to pay a debt or something like that? Um, so, no, there, there isn't anything, really. Uh, Dr. Judy, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not actually, this is actually my first presentation of the Sinaki. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, I do own one that's this tiny, because I like them small and light. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot phantom those heavy, um, ornaments on their bodies. What boggles my mind is we have several illustrations, pictures that have been drawn over you know, time that have you know, shown up in many different manuscripts and books. Could it have been possible, although they did not, there was no, there's no evidence that they are found in burial, you know, right on the burial sites. That the Chamorros did wear them, but they were not seen as important to the artists who drew these pictures. Could that have happened? Uh, I ask this question because in my own work that I'm doing, that's for presentation in March, um, I question the whole notion of being without clothes, being swimming lasso. Mm -hmm. It's a world. And could it be that in the perspective of the Chamorro people, they were in fact wearing clothes, but not clothes as known by the Western world? That could it be possible that the clothes, in quotations, if you don't mind, are these ornaments that they have put in their bodies, but as far as the Western eyes are concerned, they see nakedness. I just want to pose that question, and as I said, I really don't know how other, you know, there's another way to say it, but again, it's a question of perspective. Where are we coming from? Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, the icon of tomorrow identity is the lap Could it be that the Sinagi is another one that's coming up? And as long as it's the tomorrow people themselves who have brought this forth to become a reality today, I see no, absolutely no problem with it. And kudos to these individuals who have made the Sinati a part of our triple identity. To do as Thank you. Thank you. Um, to answer your first question uh, about whether they just didn't mention it, although they saw it, um, I, I, when I read about, for example, uh, Frezenay, and Larry Cunningham had this in his Ancient Chamorro Society book, they talked in detail, even though they didn't see them at that period in time, they interviewed people who had seen such things, like the Gwinahan Thamagugun, the, the Spondylus, they talked in detail about what these were and what they were for. So I, I would really, uh, I couldn't fathom that they wouldn't talk about this, which would obviously have been a very important item to them. I, I'd like to pose the, again, that I think it, it equates somewhat to the whale's tooth in the Polynesian society, where it is, it is kept as a treasure but when the clan needs to get together and pay a big gift or a big price, maybe that's what they took out. And maybe that's why they were linked together. I, this is just a thought. I believe they keep some of the
maybe they're very old and connected to our earliest ancestors and were passed down from generation to generation. And then I think about what you're saying, that it was only worn in very, very special occasions and then kept in a similar way of keeping skulls and in order to keep that kana from the ancestor um, who the skull belonged to. Maybe that could be a possibility mm -hmm. as to why they're not buried with the Sanahi, because the Sanahi is kept in these families as um, something that is maintaining the kana of our earliest ancestors, and that's why they're so few. And then also that could maybe be connected to why it's in the northern islands, and in you know, islands that we really don't visit very much anymore. Um, but that's, those are, that's just like, I like what you said about interpretation, that um, just because somebody's not buried in something, maybe that actually increases its value because it's very rare and it's mm -hmm. kept by the family to keep them alive. I think that's a good point. Um, yeah, if it, it, it wouldn't be buried with them if they needed to carry it along as a, as a clan valuable. So that makes sense. Yes, Joe? My personal perception of uh, thought is like when I eat this earth, um, I would like to be buried my sign, but there's a clause in my will that um, one of my family members in due time will come back and retrieve that sign to be worn. Uh, basically, as everything else on my approach, um, I, I, I contribute to a master navigator. Uh, I've, I've created tonight for close relatives, special friends that went. went. Uh, but yet they're very special to the point where there's no thought of something special. They were just a given. Um, um, for me, for me, uh, I move on. I, I, I truly feel that, that there's times where the Sinai went into the ground with a special, very special, sacred person of high regards, and only the witnesses of that moment knows what is happening. And in due time again, like retrieving the fever bone or the skulls to venerate, mm. the same moment they take this night back. And only that moment, the witnesses would know what happened. That's but, really interesting. Uh, yeah. For me, yeah. that's just very basic. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, uh, this is what I want to come out of these conversations because, you know, because they did that with the femur bones, maybe they did with, with the Sinai. That's a good new thought to me. Thank you. Um, half a day. Um, I really value the, the presentation around how artists today give uh, special value to the Sinai. I like how um, I like how you were able to present the birth of the Sinai as a body organization. Because as an artist myself, um, we make we make artwork and hope that in a way it becomes accepted. And through that um, time of acceptance, I always see it as um, after maybe a generation of it being accepted as the art form of the people, um, then it becomes part of culture and tradition. Mm -hmm. And seeing that played out and someone acknowledge that it's now become an iconic symbol of the, of the Mariana Island as a whole. Um, yeah, I really value how, um, how the Sinai was birthed, and I value how it's become accepted, and I value in a way, it just seems to me like that's and what you said. It's also like how art in itself um, is created. We mm -hmm. as artisans innovate different things that we see today. And over time, over appreciation by the community, it's then symbolized as part of the culture. For instance, me and my, the, the way I look at my own art form, it's rather very new, very contemporary, very no one knows about. Mm -hmm. and, but as an artisan experiencing his artwork over time today, it's actually really cool and it's comforting in a way as an artisan. And that sense of comfort is also a sense of realizing your spiritualness 
mm-hmm. as a true moral person or as someone who is indigenous of this island. So, in all in all, it's like I value what you've been presenting, and I really look at it as like an example of how we as artisans can further push um, what we perceive as our own identity. Yes, and there, there's in my in my main PhD thesis, I, I address this whole aspect of of uh, the symbiotic relationship between artists and activists, because activists need something to to push their identity, to make them feel connected to their past, or or to feel the passion, and the artists can can create that. So it's, it's very connected. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh. Make me walk all the way over. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, OK, OK. What are the questions? Hi. Um, has there been any attempt to date the tsunami in uh, Germany? I'd have to turn this to a, an archaeologist, but my understanding is that you need a, a carbon, you know, in the in the traditional way of, of dating. Yes, please. Yeah, yes, please, Mike. Uh, the the shell, the shell, the question, the the, the human shell, the giant clam. Well, yeah. Now, could, it, it does have carbon in it, so it is dateable by carbon directly. However, did they? Um, when did they yeah, find the shell? Yeah, they're also. Just the shell. Mm-hmm. 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 There's nothing in the carving or no, but uh, based on the context of the sites, uh, the way they've been described, uh, these date to the middle to late uh, Latin period, uh, which would be uh, from approximately the year like 1400 to 1700, uh, at least those that have been recorded. Could be older, but that's like that's as good as we're going to get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very approximate with, with the, the way the concepts were recorded. Okay, I guess that wasn't the brightest uh, question. Um, okay, the second one is I heard that there was a person found in a burial site in Saipan with the tsunami. Now, Did you hear about that? Well, in, in my talk, I mentioned that third hand, this person had said yes. Uh, this was given to me by my sister, whose, whose friend found it in Saipan, in Sariguan. And it was on the neck of the frontal part of the body. And, and so, yes, there is That's that reference. The That's the only one that we know of. Okay. Now, again, you know, I'm not saying there was never a burial with a Sinai. You know, it's, it, it, it could happen. It's just that it doesn't look like it was the norm. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. We have a gentleman in the house. Yeah. He's wearing a spotless um, pendant. And in your presentation, you said that Al Lazama referred to the gravesite of the fire as the princess of Ipa. Or Ipa. Ipa, yeah. I'd like to ask the prince of Jigo why he's wearing a spotless linen. Ambush. <laughs> um, I wear, I wear spotless because to me it represents um, as you saw in the in the in the, uh, in the slide there, the, uh, the female that was wearing spondylus, 
I, I think I agree with that. I think mostly females were probably the only females were using spotless. I used mine to um, remember my natural lineage. I inherited that from my mother, who inherited it from her mother, and on and on. And so I, I wear it now to represent that. Yeah. I thought we should share that. Yeah. Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> so getting back to the gender, getting back to the gender, um, I think the gender thing is something that has been created through the artistic efforts because of the huge bond, I mean the huge Sanahi just doesn't, I, I wouldn't want to wear it. I mean, my neck would hurt. Uh, maybe that's how <laughs> ancient Chamorros got the big bulge on their neck because they were wearing Sinai. I don't know. I'm just being facetious here. But, but the, the spondylus was uh, mostly associated with women, but uh, Judith Amesbury's talk said that there were cases of men wearing spondylus. So. In your presentation, you talked about um, how the Sanahi was made for you over you're wearing it, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you say where you got that and why yes. you chose to wear a sign? Um, this was given to me by Joe Guerrero when I was first I first started interviewing him when he was doing his collection Pilar way, way back and before two thousand, I think it's about nineteen ninety six. Yeah, Geoff Pogo. That's when I, I contacted a lot of artists. So uh, he gave me this one and I uh, to be honest, I didn't think of it as a, as a Sinai because they weren't that, I, I wasn't aware of that many Sinai around, but now, yes, it could be very much a Sinai. Joe, what, was it a Sinai when you made it? <laughs> Contemporary Sinai. And the outlook is missing, but you can always... Yeah. The number of people that are wearing the Sanahi today, especially the men of various sizes, your presentation talked about the important significance of their role, their importance, their um, masculinity, power, and their presence. Um, how do you feel about the fact that if everyone wore the Sanahi, how special would it be then? If everyone wore it. Now, this is just a personal feeling I have. I really treasure something that's given to me. I, I've, and, and I'm not saying that don't buy the Sinai, wait till somebody gives it to you because <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happen very often. But, but I think the value of, of the Sinai uh, to, to the wearer and to the people who see the wearer is often reflected in the actions of the wearer. You know, so um, that's, that's just my opinion. But also, I, I know a lot of artists create their own, and they wear them, and I think that's fabulous, just showing off their, their art. Anybody else? OK, let's give her a hand. <laughs> I'd like to have a picture up here eventually before you leave. Anyone wearing a Sanahi, please? And if you just want to be in the picture, come too. You know. <laughs> Actually, let's do that now. Let's do that now.